I want to welcome everybody here tonight in the audience. It's nice to see some people come out and uh, take in a council meeting. And uh, thanks for the staff. They're all here tonight. So I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, is there a closed meeting report? No closed meeting report tonight. Uh, any conflict of interest amongst council members here tonight? Seeing none, we'll go to uh, the adoption of the uh, published agenda. Uh, that the published agenda for the March 18th regular council me meeting be adopted as presented or amended. And through you, Mr. Chair, I do have one amendment to speak to. Uh, that would be item 8.4 on the agenda. Uh, the third recommendation uh, under that report, item 8.4, uh, the third recommendation should read that council direct administration to review and report back on the feasibility subject to budget constraints of retaining a marketing planning consultant to undertake a local comprehensive review on the adequacy and sufficiency of our residential and employment land allocations within this planning period to 2031 to determine whether or not the reallocation of primary settlement area lands for re residential and employment land uses is warranted and where new mid or higher sorry new mid and higher density residential development should be prioritized by location and that's it thank you mr chair thank you any questions on that can I have a motion, please, to adopt? Uh, Councillor Bowman, seconder, uh, Deputy Mayor Malash, all in favor? It's carried. Adoption of minutes, item 5.1, that the minutes of the regular council meeting held March 4th be adopted as circulated. Any questions? Can I have a mover? Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Vandendolen, all in favor? It's carried. 2 that the minutes of the special council meeting held March 4th 2019 be adopted as circulated I have a mover seconder uh, seconder deputy mayor Malash and councillor Vanderbilt any questions on this one all in favor it's carried 5.3 that the minutes of the special council meeting held February 26 2019 be adopted as circulated Mover, please. Uh, Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Verbeek, any questions on this one? All in favor? It's carried. And 5.4, that the minutes of the special council meeting of February 25th, 2019 be adopted as circulated. I have a mover, please. Uh, Councillor Bowman and Councillor Vandenau, any questions on this one? All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair, under reports, item eight uh, of the agenda 8.1 is legal and legislative services report 2019-10 re local boards committees procedures and best practices manual that said report providing council with an updated and amended copy of the procedures and best practices document be received and approved could I have a mover to receive uh, councillor bondi seconder councillor bowman any questions on this all in favor? It's carried. 8.2 is building report 2019-02. That said report providing council with an update on building activity within the town of Essex for the month of February 2019 be received. Have a mover, please. Councillor Bjorkman. Seconder. Councillor Vanendal. Any questions on this one? All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. 8.3 is planning report 2019-11 re-Harold Junior School rezoning application and this is together with bylaw 1796 being a bylaw to amend the comprehensive zoning bylaw 1037 and 1797 being a bylaw to provide that part lot control shall not apply to certain lands within registered plan 1236 for receipt that and that council approve the rezoning of the noted lands and accordingly that bylaw 1796 be uh, provisionally passed this evening and that bylaw 1797 uh, being a bylaw to provide the part lot control shall not apply to those lands identified uh, be uh, received three readings uh, this evening March 18th can I have a mover to receive it councillor Bowman and councillor Verby any questions Deputy Mayor Malash. Thank you through your worship to um, uh, probably to Mr. Watson. Uh, I'm looking at the the, uh, the drawing that with the draft uh, parkland still in the middle 
and I'm just wondering when we pass this tonight this doesn't settle any of that issue of whether we take ownership or whether we don't take ownership through mr. mayor we've had subsequent meetings with the proponents and and the parkland has been eliminated uh, it's the other options are being explored as far as stormwater management is concerned the the property will be put into a holding residential zone which means the hold will stay until uh, uh, there's a signed and executed uh, development agreement and, and that will be part of the, the review package excellent thank you very much thank you your worship and I want to thank the opponents that are here tonight and uh, we really appreciate your development so uh, councillor Bondi Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think there may be a typo on the report where it says the street trees on Victor, and it may be Arthur. I'm not sure. I don't know. We've had a lot of development going on there. But anyways, that's not uh, my question. I just want to bring forward the concerns again in the, in the open meeting that some of the residents, their only worry, they're very excited that this is happening. Their only worry is abatement of the asbestos. You know, when that comes forward, they're, they're concerned. There's, there's a couple people that have uh, home daycares and young children around there, so that's one of the concerns. A concern that I have as a counselor through you, Mr. Mayor, perhaps to our planner, Jeff Watson, or our policy planner, is is the uh, waiving of development fees, which expires this August, is that enough to get this development started? And does that put this development at risk? Our development fees uh, by law in Harrow expires this August. So it's, it's kind of an elephant in the room. I want to get ahead of it and make sure that that we can either get the shovels in the ground and the permits drawn before then, or this council has to have a discussion about extending that or not extending that. And I do know we are waiting for that meeting on development fees, but I still think, uh, you know, there is a lot of cost to developing this junior school, and I do believe the people in Harrow really want to see this developed. So I don't, I don't want any hiccups. Thank you, Councillor. I agree with you. And uh, this is something I, I, I think will be addressed anyways. I, I, I just can't see uh, people coming forward and going to develop. And we have another one, too, is uh, Delabana. Okay, we have some developers there, and I, I'm sure we can work through that. Uh, I'm, I don't think, as I'm not going to speak for the whole council, but I, I don't think we're going to take away development fees when they've already put an application in to the to develop in or in Ward 4. So that's my take, but uh, it's up to uh, Council. So. If, um, who could answer it? Somebody on administration. How about you, Chris? Could you uh, comment on that or no? Okay. Uh, through your worship. In terms of development charges, uh, we're doing our development charge study uh, this year as well, which will encompass the entire municipality. So uh, I think how it affects the development is not up to us, right? It's, it, it depends on the proponent. The development charge study will um, look at development charges throughout the municipality, whether they change, whether they're waived, what we're going to do with them. So I, th I think my recommendation to Council is go through that development charge study process and see how that pans out for you. That has to be done by the end of August as well. So that timing fits with the expiration of uh, the Harrow lapse. Okay, thank you, Chris. And, and by the way, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Chris, I didn't introduce you as our new CAO. He started tonight. I, I forgot to introduce him. So sorry about that, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> So on the motion, all in favor of the motion? It's carried. Thank you. 8.4 Planning Report 2019-12. That said report be received and that the Planning Department give public notice for an official plan amendment and zoning change and that Council direct administration to review and report back on the feasibility of retaining a marketing planning consultant for the stated purposes noted in said report. Have a mover? Or, yeah, we'll mover and a seconder, and then I'll ask for questions. Mover, um, Chris Vanderdoe, or Councillor Vanderdoe, and Councillor Bondi. Questions? Councillor? Um, I have a couple of questions of administration. First of all, how much will this report cost? And I know the immediate answer is we don't know, but is it going to be more than 10000 more than 25000 more than 50000 And I'd like to know how long this, uh, this study is going to take. And I have some follow-up questions, too. 
Jeff, if you can answer that. Through you, Mr. Mayor, it's certainly more than 10,000, probably in the range of about 25,000. It, it probably would depend on who you hired as well, because, uh, for example, uh, Watson and Associates, they, they are doing the development charges review. They know the area. They probably have a better idea of what's, you know, what the situation is down here. But, you know, for a, a call for proposals, it would likely be in the $25,000 range. Go ahead, Councillor. And how long do you expect it? Uh, from a timing point of view, I don't think it would take that long. It's it's a question of looking at 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 the amount of land we have for residential and employment lands. Employment lands are commercial and industrial. It would they would be looking at at the distribution of those lands and the suitability of those lands. So they'd have to look at 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 the sheer amount of land. They'd have to look at the servicing that's available. They'd have to look at 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 traditional market trends in residential and employment. So those are those are not that complicated for someone who's basically, you know, involved in this on a regular basis. Uh, through the chair, uh, do, do, we, do we know of any developments that this report might hold up that, that are waiting in the wings? There are people that are interested that this might irritate? Through Mr. Mayor, yes, there, there, there ha we have had conversations. That's what initiated the, the original review in the first place. Uh, what happened was, though, that we met with the county planners, so they're the approval authority, and we were advised that, that in their opinion, we're overzoned for residential, so what's the point of pushing for more multiple residential? Our position, of course, is that it's all very nice to have residential zoning, but you have to have the proper services, you have to have the proper location to, to, to make these things viable. So uh, what, their, the, what their requirement was, or request, is that we do what's called a local comprehensive review, which is what, exactly what the consultant would be doing, to, to look at allocation and distribution of these lands and their suitability. Um, we, have, we had a proponent on in the Essex Motel, and that's that. That's why we split that off from the uh, from the overall review, and the, they have at least tentatively agreed that they would support an official plan amendment to accommodate the Essex Motel to to affordable residential. We've also had other inquiries as well, but we've had no formal formal um, submissions at this point, other than the Essex Motel. Uh, but Mr. Chair, I I'm just concerned that we don't really need this. The study. I mean, you know, I get complaints, I've heard complaints for years from from residents about us hiring too many, uh, uh, or just having too many studies commissioned. Uh, on the one hand, I'm in favor of those because they can often save taxpayers money by contracting out. But sometimes they're superfluous and redundant. Uh, th this one seems to be. I mean, Mr. Watson is our expert on this, and and he's already explained to us that we need we need this multiple residential zonings, and uh, I think. We're unanimous in agreeing on this. Am I clear in, in thinking that that the county is making us spend this money and and waste this time and uh, potentially scare off some development for this study? Through Mr. Mayor, no. I, I, you know, technically they're correct. It's a, it's a re, it's really a provincial mandate, uh, and I actually agree with them. It's been it's been ten years since we did our official plan. We've kept it up to date as far as provincial requirements and mandates are concerned, but we've never really looked at the distribution of land uses and how 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 well we've reflected, you know, tomorrow's needs and trends. And uh, but I'm not saying it's required today. Uh, if you put it in the 2020 budget, I think that would be fine. Chris, uh, through your worship, <coughs> Councillor Vanderdolen, that's why the amendment to the agenda was that that one be changed from retaining to investigate and come back to council with uh, some budgetary numbers and some timelines. So just f for you to tell us to investigate it, look into it, get some more detail on it, knowing um, what you know through this report, and then we'll come back with that. And I'm guessing, as, as uh, Mr. Watson noted, we're probably going to be pushing into, well, we'll have a new director by then, and then... 2020 budget. Well, thank you. I, I still have the feeling that, that we already know the subject well enough, but it's got to be done. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor B. Arkman. Thank you, uh, through your worship. Um, I was just, that's, that's one of the things as we're going through this exercise that I've learned to be a little bit frustrated with, but these things, this is, this is a county mandate to us. And unfortunately, we don't have jurisdiction over our own uh, residential areas and commercial areas. So this is something that we've got to build a case 
prove to the county we really do need this development and we actually have developers that want to do this so that's part of the we have to look at that investment of okay we're going to have to do a study because they won't take our word for it that this is something we need is that does the study pay off and I guess that's that's the balancing act and asking uh, administration to go back to the drawing board as far as just looking at it let's look at the cost what's the benefit to us and then we take that investment and say is this investment going to pay us and if it is then we go ahead and do it but unfortunately this is something that's mandated outside of our hands and if we don't have this they won't say okay you can go ahead and change your uh, your zoning so it's it's that catch-22 there's only one taxpayer they're they're paying the taxes to the county and they're paying the taxes to us um, but sometimes this is the investment we have to make to get these developments Thank you, Councillor. I'm just as frustrated as I, I think some of the councillors here, right? Because <clears throat> in the south end, that one piece there, Jeff, I'm talking about, it only makes sense that it's residential there. But uh, now we have to go back and tell this person that he's, he's on hold for a while. So, yeah, it's frustrating. So, any other questions on this one? Okay, all in favor? Scary. Thank you. 8.5 Corporate Services 2019-04 Report under Section 284 of the Municipal Act Statement of Remuneration and Expenses Paid 2018 Said report for receipt this evening I have a motion uh, Councillor Vandendal and Councillor Bjorkman Any questions? All in favor? It's carried 6 Community Services 2019-009 Read 2019 Communities in Bloom Legacy Tree Program Sub report for receipt this evening I have a mover uh, Deputy Mayor Malash and Councillor Verbeek Any questions on this? All in favor? It's carried 7 Economic Development 2019-01 Read Essex Tourism Development Fund That said report be received and supported Mover please Councillor Verbeek and seconder, Deputy Mayor Malash. Any questions? Uh, Councillor Bondi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for bringing this forward. I, I think it's good to have this framework. I've missed out on the Finance Committee for a, a a term now go heading into a second term so I've avoided some of these uh, some of these issues my one thing is I, I personally just for my own comments I think the thousand dollar threshold is, is is low I do for the amount of uh, hopefully we get lots of organizations applying my fear is that there's a lot of hoops to hop through and that the thousand uh, dollars could be a little higher that's just from from what I've seen I don't know I haven't been on the Finance Committee so I don't know but you know and I also think of it may be hard for people to prove the percentage of attendees from outside the community. That's, that's kind of, could be subjective. Like, it's, it's really hard to prove. For example, in, I believe in my first term on council, I helped a local woman, Anne-Marie Grant, do the Harrow Art Walk. And it was on the main street of Harrow. I think it was before both of your time <laughs> here in the town. So we closed the road off, and blankets were put down, and goods were sold on the middle of the road. We... We ran two of them. She ran two of them. The first one was really successful because it was paired on the weekend of Explore the Shore, and it had lots of people there. The second one, not so much because there was two done in the same summer. So, and it's hard to see who's out of town. I mean, I can kind of tell who's from Harrow and who's not from Harrow, but it, it is hard. Like, are you checking them off? And also, I think of it this way, right? Like a tourist. What is a tourist? Yes, I want, I know what a tourist is, but... A tourist from outside our municipality is good, but also people spending money inside our municipality is good. For example, people getting people from Essex Center to Harrow and to Colchester, that's good too, right? Like we want them to come to Colchester and come to our restaurants and I want to come here. So it's not like, and if those groups or, or initiatives need help getting our people spending money, if people have money to spend, that live in our municipality, I want to encourage them to spend money here too. So to, to say uh, completely that I just want to market outside, I want to market both. I want to market anybody that has luxury money to spend. So th those are my comments that it's a, the thousand dollars seems a little restrictive and, and I, th I think there's a lot of hoops to jump through for that thousand dollars. 
Thank you, uh, Councillor. I think maybe we could have the administration look at that, you know, look into it. But anyways, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, any other? Uh, Councillor Bjorkman. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to Councillor Bondi's statements, I, I agree that um, we, we want to bring people into our community, but we want people in our community to engage it as well. And as simple as just having a couple of people at one point in the day, I don't know, I'm sure you've got plans already to just do a, a survey of, you know, where you're from. Get out there, interact with the people. If they're coming to a booth, you know, piece of paper down there, just check the box. We're from this town, that town, because it's a great way for us to see where people are coming from. So when we're spending our advertising dollars trying to bring people in, if we already know there's a community out there someplace that knows us, well, what a great place for us to focus um, our attention at getting people in. So I think a, there's a great a tool in finding out where the people are coming from that are attending our festivals. And from what I'm reading, it doesn't say here that there has to be a certain percentage coming from outside of our area. It just says, what is the percentage of people coming from outside your area? So I think that's still, that's a very good uh, data point to collect if, if we can. And there's, there's a multitude of ways to do that. Um, my question regarding it is, will this be directed the same way uh, that we do at the beginning of the year when we're handing out uh, the other grants and uh, uh, special monies uh, through the finance committee? Or is this something that's going to be open through the year that people can apply to as their events are coming up? Thank you, Councillor. Um, Nelson, uh, could you respond to that, please? Through you, Your Worship. Um, so I'm going to touch on three things here. Um, the outside uh, residents or attract, or sorry, outside attendees, it's just you have to make an effort to attract outside attendees or attract tourists to your events, whether that's through uh, targeted marketing uh, through your event, but keeping track of the attendees at your event as well, uh, I think is very important. So we want to show that uh, you're doing that as well, just so when you come to apply the next year after that, you can show that you had an increase in outside uh, outside attendees. I think marketing the event locally is important as well and I think um, some of the past events have done a good job of doing that just we want to see how this money is going to be spent elevating your event. Uh, the second uh, point on the thousand uh, dollar budget so it's a thousand dollars uh, if it's less than thirty-five thousand two thousand dollars if it's over thirty-five thousand um, again this is a um, kind of a first year revamp trial. We can look at that uh, afterwards, after the first year, and see if um, see the intake, see the uptake uh, in the application, and see um, how, how well it was received by uh, people that are applying for it, whether it was too much work to apply for the $1,000, or uh, whether they want to see uh, an increase in that, potentially. So that, that's, that's one thing we're going to look at after. Um, and the third thing, it's an ongoing intake uh, throughout the whole year. Uh, applications will be, because there's so many events throughout the year, it would be hard to do one intake or two intakes. It's throughout the year. Uh, we'll look over the application. Um, provide some recommendations to uh, to council to see what uh, applications move forward and which ones don't. Um, and then at that time, council will approve um, the events that get the funding. Okay. Councillor Bowman. Uh, just a comment there as well. That information is really important to all the organizations that are they're planning a festival or an event. Um, in the past, the Canada South Festival Network has supplied some of those services to their membership um, um, of events. And they actually send a crew out to over the weekend or over the event to take those kind of numbers that you need, basically, where they're from, how much they're spending, how much is local, and a whole list of questions. So, And that is good feedback that, that for those organizations because how do you know where to... to, to um, focus your your advertising or whatever you're doing if you don't know who your your customer is so it's so important that you you have that feedback on what you're doing and initially you can do it fairly easily by I'll just for example a raffle on something or it's free people have to fill out a little card to to register I mean it tells you all you want to know they're where they're from and those kind of things what they're trying to do it's not you know a, a great um, a a a accuracy, but at least it gives you some feedback to start with. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other organizations that do it on a professional basis as well. So uh, it's so important to get it back to your organization and 
and know where you're going, especially the next year when you're when you're uh, planning your event. So um, the, that type of thing is is great. Thank you, Councillor Alex. Did you have a comment on it? Yeah, I just wanted to add uh, through the chair. Um, we definitely don't want to make the process onerous. I know there are local nonprofits or hosting organizations. Uh, the ministry, um, the tourism ministry in Ontario, provides some tools. Um, for measuring and estimating um, tourism uh, visitation. So I think it would be also a matter of uh, marketing those tools, providing those tools and uh, resources to the groups that are hosting uh, the events so we can help them basically find the tools that makes it easier for them to um, assess the, tourisms, uh, the tourists that are coming in. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I just want to thank Nelson and yourself for promoting the town. You guys are doing a very, very good job promoting this. Thank you. Uh, all in favor of the motion then? It's carried. Thank you. Yeah. Item 9, any reports from our youth member this evening? No report for tonight. Thank you. Item 10, any updates from County Council this evening? None from County no. Council this evening. Okay. Item 11.1. That all of the correspondence listed in agenda item 11.1 be received and where indicated to further share with the community using suitable methods of communication. It's great we're getting a par partnership fund. Thank you. All in favor? It's carried. Eleven point two point one, Town of Saugeen Shores. That the correspondence from the Town of Saugeen Shores asking Essex Council to consider supporting their resolution, requesting that the governments move forward with accepting applications for funding under the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program be received or received and supported, and if Council chooses to so support, that the appropriate letters be sent to the federal and provincial governments, uh, the MP, MPP, Parks and Rec Ontario, and the Town of Saugeen Shores. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malash is a mover, seconder. Receive and support. Receive and read. And Councillor Bowman, any questions? All in favor? Thank you. It's carried. 11.2.2. That the youth council member application received from Cameron Susie be received, and that in accordance with resolution R1903 096 passed at the March 4th meeting, that council grant an exemption from the town's procedural bylaw, and that Cameron Susie be appointed as a town of Essex youth council member for the term of 2019 2020. Councillor Verbeek, seconder. Councillor Bannon, it looks like somebody's going to be sitting beside you. That's great news. Thank you. All in favor? It's carried. It took a long time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Item 12 that the committee meeting, uh, sorry, committee meeting minutes listed in agenda item 12, together with any recommendations noted, be received, approved, and adopted as circulated. Over. Receive it. Adopt it. Uh, Councillor Verbeek and Deputy Mayor Malash, any questions? All in favor? Okay. Item 15.1, uh, the following notice of motion was originally presented at the March 4th meeting and is being brought forward for consideration this evening. Uh, moved by Councillor Bondi, that Council have a public discussion about the level of service they wish to see it, uh, in the fire department when it comes to water and ice rescue, and that Council further provide direction, subject to budget constraints, as to the level of training equipment they wish the fire department to possess as it relates to water and ice rescue. Uh, as moved by Council Bondi, would need a seconder, and uh, uh, assuming the motion carries, uh, we also have a PowerPoint presentation uh, from our Fire Chief Rick Arnell this evening. <coughs> So we need a, we do need a mover and a seconder, um, Councillor Bondi and Deputy Mayor Malash. So, <clears throat> uh, and a vote, please. Can I can I vote vote on it? So we can. Don't we have to have a vote for the proper? Yes. Yeah, but 
Yeah, we'll receive it separately. Okay, uh, Doug, did you have a comment? Just for you, Your Worship. Just so Council is aware, with Council Bonnie bringing the motion forward and its content, I thought it was important that the Fire Department prepared a presentation which may answer some of your questions, kind of where we sit now um, and where we may go. So that was the purpose, and they, the Chief and Deputy Chief put together a very comprehensive presentation on that. So, Thank you, Doug. You can go ahead, uh, Chief, when you're... Through your worship, uh, tonight, uh, Deputy Fire Chief Malott and myself are going to tag team this uh, PowerPoint presentation. And what we're looking at doing is kind of showing you where we are, where we were, where we are today, and how we're moving forward with our ice water rescue team. So as we know, we, we went through, we, we had our orientation with council and we talked about the ENR bylaw. The ENR bylaw, as you can see in the two highlighted red, it says water rescue, we do shore-based rescue plus basic water entry, and ice water rescue, we do shore-based rescue. Currently, that's the level of service through our ENR bylaw that mayor and council has set for the municipality. The next slide is also within the ENR bylaw, and what it shows is limited and agreement services. So these are services that we have agreements with other municipalities to come and help us in the event of an emergency. And again, we've highlighted in red water rescue entry, boat. Uh, the town of Kingsville will come to our aid uh, if, if we have an issue. And ice water rescue, they're advanced trained, and they will come, Kingsville, the town of Kingsville will come and help us as well. So just a little background info, in, in, uh, the Canadian Coast Guard and the Ontario Provincial Police are the two authorities having jurisdiction for Lake Erie. Now that's right from the, the shoreline out to the center line, the, the international border. So that's all coordinated through JRCC, which is the Joint Rescue Coordination out of Trenton. That's the entity that takes care of all of Lake Erie. So currently the OPP take direction from JR. The OPP don't even have the jurisdiction. They take direction from JRCC. OPP and Canada Coast Guard provide air support for any issue we have out on the, on the lake, as well as marine search and rescue and also uh, underwater search and rescue. With all that in mind, the town of Essex we still have lots to worry about in water. We have, uh, you know, all our inland waterways that we want, that we're concerned about, right? We have uh, ditches, creeks, ponds, rivers, all those entities, uh, lagoons that we're worried about, and, and that's what we're trying to provide a service for. So as we know, uh, back in 2015, we came with a, a new ENR bylaw. At that point in time, uh, we, we did shore-based rescue and council at the time, and, and I believe your worship, you were part of that team that, that directed us into ensuring that we moved forward and did more than what we were scheduled to do. So we were directed by council in 2015 to identify the gaps in the service uh, for our community. So what we've done is we went together, we, we, uh, we surveyed our, our three stations to, to manifest a 10-person uh, team of individuals to provide response to any emergency calls regarding water, ice water. Um, so what we did is we went out and bought some, some uh, basic equipment to get this team rolling. Uh, we've, we've since uh, run into some, and as you see the asterisk on training, we have run into some hiccups with provincial government. In 2014, there was a terrible accident where someone lost their life while training, doing ice water training, and the province of Ontario, the fire college, pulled the training and ceased it at that point in time. So we didn't have any clear direction on what training we should do and, and what level we needed to train to. So we continued to, to get some basic entities together. We trained our personnel. And uh, we, we bought some basic equipment, and we're looking at now enhancing that in our capital budget moving forward next year. And we'll talk about the budget more towards the end. So what we did is we sat down and we did a risk analysis. So Lake Erie 
goes from Carter Road 41 to 23, which is about 16 kilometers of shoreline, but that falls under the jurisdiction, as I said earlier, Coast Guard, Joint Rescue Coordination Center, and, and, and they provide that service. Now, as we talk Coast Guard, the Guardian, which we know the Guardian is, is out in Colchester, works for the Coast Guard. They're an auxiliary Coast Guard unit. So if there was an issue on the lake, the Coast Guard would call the Guardian to go out and respond to it, which they could respond to anywhere within that 16 kilometers and or to the point or wherever, right, wherever the Coast Guard would need them. So again, I, as I spoke earlier, the inland water is, is what we're really concerned about. We, the town of Essex, as well as the OPP, we got to make sure that creeks, ponds, streams, lagoons, those things that we can provide the services, something happens in event, something happens in one of those. And then we have flooding. And the reason we have flooding, and Deputy Chief Mulan, as, as he goes through some of the training stuff, will kind of explain uh, fast-moving water and swift water and why that, that entity falls even on, on land. So again, that falls under the, your, our jurisdiction as the town. So we went through, and from January of 2008 to December of 2018, we, we took all the 3,909 incidents we responded to. 13 of those were water-related incidents, which factors into less than half a percent of what we actually do in responding to incidents. Out of those 13 incidents, one incident, we had to actually get a boat. So we had Kingsville come and help us on that event. Thank you. Uh, just to carry on a little bit before we carry on further into the training requirements, I just wanted to break this down and explain that uh, water rescue operations fall into a specialized category uh, when it comes to the fire department's operations. Day-to-day -day firefighting operations are covered under one standard, one set of guidelines, one set of training. Uh, water rescue is broken down into a specialized uh, type task discipline and requires additional training. Um, as you can see in the, in the three different categories, it's, it's broken down into what I'm going to identify as three different levels, but then there's also specific disciplines um, based on the environmental conditions or the water conditions that are faced. Uh, the term ice water rescue team uh, is used as, a, as an overall perspective of what the team does, but understand that ice is completely separate level of training or condition that has to be trained to versus open water uh, versus uh, swift water. Swift water is identified as water that's moving faster than one knot, which is actually uh, slower than mo uh, most people walk. Um, ice water is also inclusive of open cold water, so anything that's 70 degrees or below requires a different level of training. Uh, when we look through these trainings, I just wanted to highlight that you're going to see in the different categories, uh, shore-based rescue requires a, a, a specific level of training, which is awareness level or operations level. Uh, and then it breaks down further if you're going to enter the water. As soon as you put a foot in the water or a hand in the water, it uh, requires technician level. So there's awareness level, operations level, technician level. Um, awareness level slash operations level will allow a, a personnel or a staff member to work from the shore or support a technician who's entering the water. Uh, and then over and above and beyond that is an additional level uh, which requires those basic levels, some advanced levels, and then that's motorized watercraft or powered watercraft levels. And that requires all of the levels plus boat operator levels. Go ahead. Along with those different levels and broken down over the training pieces, we obviously have some equipment requirements. And as we step through those different levels, uh, we also see some different equipment requirements. So if we're going to provide shore-based rescue, uh, for example, you'll see we have PFDs. We'll have to wear personal flotation devices. We need ropes and things to uh, reach and or assist people from shore. But as soon as we enter the water, there's a whole other level of, of equipment requirements. We have to have thermal protection and water protection for contaminated or cold water, uh, ropes, rigging equipment, uh, and then obviously some type of a craft. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a motorized or a powered watercraft, but a craft to allow the crew to safely work in the water and, and remove themselves. And then if we were to look beyond that into marine patrol or marine rescue, uh, there would be all of that equipment plus powered watercraft. A 
Uh, training requirements. Uh, this again touches on the different levels, so that awareness and operations level versus technician level versus marine operator technician level. Uh, and then that is broken down further by uh, different uh, environmental conditions. And we'll look at that a little bit in the inland water section. But uh, our shore-based awareness and operations level training is provided to every firefighter within our service. That is the awareness level and the operations support level for technicians. Um, that is a basic requirement under basic firefighter training and it has an annual requalification level uh, of a couple of hours worth of training that allows them to support the technicians. Technician level training is a little, is, is a quite a bit more in depth and especially when you break it down over the different environments, when you break it down on uh, open water versus ice water versus swift water, um, you can see that there's, there's some annual requirements. There's an initial swim test that's required of every, any technician that's going to be entering the water before they even uh, participate in initial uh, technician level training. They have to conduct an, uh, an initial swim test, which will provide them with, with proficiencies in swimming to conduct those, uh, those technician levels. And then the technician levels would be broken down further beyond that after the initial swim test. They would learn their disciplines and skill sets in ice water or cold water, open water and then swift moving water. Um, for marine operations, it would be the same level of training plus additional boat operation training. Okay. So kind of as a, a brief overall look, we look at the resources. This is just kind of a, a map of the overall area highlighting some of the resources that would be available um, to the waterway looking over Lake Erie. I know it's a little bit hard to see up there on the screen with the black and I apologize. But uh, we have directly down below Colchester, our Colchester Guardian logo uh, there on the water. We have the OPP Marine Unit in their season when their Marine Unit is on patrol. So we do have uh, Marine operators on land in patrol vehicles, but we also throughout the open water boating season have the OPP Marine Unit on Lake Erie and in our Detroit River waterways. We have the Canadian Coast Guard, the Canadian Coast Guard base, uh, main base other than the Guardian, uh, Guardian Auxiliary vessel is located in Amherstburg. It's about a 24 kilometer trip around to what I'll call the Central Point or, or Colchester. They also utilize the resources of the US Coast Guard being a bordering, um, uh, bordering federal agency. They can call upon the US Coast Guard and that is all again coordinated through the JRCC out, on, out in Trenton being their jurisdiction. Uh, one other vessel that is commonly out on the waterway within our area is the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources. It's also noted that any vessel that is in a waterway that is known or knows of a uh, waterborne emergency, a water-based emergency, as a mariner is also required to respond to that emergency if they're within uh, distance or know of it and they can safely do so. Just a quick question, Rick. <clears throat> the MNR, their boat, is it stationed in a location uh, in Amherstburg or Leamington or, or they trailer that boat and put it in? I, I'm not 100% sure. I do believe it is a trailer boat. I know they do have a trailer boat, uh, but I do know they're in the water quite often. And I, do. I've seen them in the water several times, but uh, I was just wondering if they're stationed in Amherstburg. I know the OPP is in Amherstburg, and they do have a boat in Leamington now too, I'm, I'm aware of. I believe, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the OPP exactly where their docking situation is, but I do know that they often use both docks um, and they have several vessels. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to touch base as well and kind of highlight for inland water. We have a significant amount of inland water. That can include ditches, ponds, lagoons, uh, waterways, creeks, streams, rivers, and or overland flooding in the event of flooding uh, emergencies in areas that would normally not have water. Uh, those can often become water emergencies or water-based emergency. Uh, and obviously our resources are a little bit different for inland water. Um, I'll use the Cedar Creek area, for example. If we responded to Cedar Creek, the resources that we would have available for Lake Erie are not going to be available for that body of water. The Coast Guard is not able to uh, access that area like they would the lake. Uh, touching base on an actual water rescue. Uh, on average, water rescue incidents require the following staffing levels. So it's important to note that uh, if one person is going to be entering the water as a technician, the average is about uh, three to four supporting staff members on land. We have to have uh, rigging, rope, 
tender lines, um, and, and a quite a few steps that are involved to, for every person that enters the water. So uh, on average, when we say for, for a normal rescue of one to two persons, three to four technicians may enter the water, but we still have to have eight to 10 awareness or operation level uh, supporting tender personnel on shore. And that is all staff. So all our staff have that level of, of training. Uh, and then obviously one overall incident commander uh, from the fire service that would direct that rescue operation. Uh, the above chart may be a bit difficult to see in, in, the, in the lighting here, but this is uh, kind of an overall perspective of the county fire services. Uh, we've pulled the uh, county fire services to find out uh, whereabouts each department is at with uh, their level of service um, and also uh, what uh, services they provide or, or levels of service they provide. Um, column one is identified as shore-based or awareness operations level and all departments within Windsor and Essex County uh, provide shore-based uh, awareness level training to all of their staff and are equipped to provide shore-based rescue. Um, the next column over the middle column is water entry. Water entry level training is the number of staff that are trained or are being trained um, to enter the water as a technician level um, and then the th Third column or far right hand column is a column that identifies departments which have a marine vessel um, for water, water based rescue operations from boat. Um, I stand corrected on one of those vessels is Leamington. The two that are highlighted red um, and the Leamington one is highlighted red. We thought that was a Coast Guard Auxiliary. That was a, a, a mistake in color coding that. The LaSalle vessel, vessel uh, is also another Coast Guard Auxiliary vessel uh, which is identified and trained to that level uh, and they provide that they have some uh, some significant risk um, based items within their municipality that they've identified such as islands, um, marinas, inlets and, and waterways that have allowed them um, the opportunity to become Coast Guard Auxiliary. Islands. Uh, Based upon the, uh, the risk analysis, based upon the level of training and the commitment from our staff um, moving forward in 2015 and like Chief had, had noted to, one of the struggles with this is the timing of how this happened with uh, a couple of deaths in relation to some, some training that had happened throughout the province of Ontario and the Ontario Fire College and Ontario Fire Marshal's Office retracting the current um, training program for the province of Ontario, it left a lot of municipalities kind of in limbo uh, and especially uh, municipalities that were in the process of establishing or starting or elevating their level of service, uh, such as with our case prior to 2015, we had shore based only. Um, we were looking for a training program and if that training program is not available, we weren't able to offer that and that has just now become available. Uh, we have a training program that allows us to fill that gap and our recommendation is that we continue with uh, shore-based water rescue for all staff and uh, a technician-based team uh, of 10 that we have right now that is committed to that training um, and the equipment within, within budget. And we also have um, the recommendation that powered watercraft, that advanced level operator level at this point in time be provided from Amherstburg Fire Department and Kingsville Fire Department as identified in our establishing regulating bylaw. Your Worship, so to kind of pull some of that together, as Deputy Chief Malott said, and you talk about the training and we kind of got put on hold. All those municipalities that had established teams prior to were able to continue and continue the training that were, they were doing, but we were new in the business and we didn't, we didn't have the availability to any of the new training syllabus to ensure that our people were be, being trained correctly. So now where are we? Uh, we just uh, finished up having two staff, our, our two full-time staff trained as trainer facilitators. Uh, that allowed us to purchase the uh, training package that we can bring back to the 
10 person team we have and we're going to provide them with that training so then they'll be doing their annual recertification swim test recertification as well as training that 10 person team to ice water rescue the next portion of this and the next staff uh, the, the next step into this process is now we found a uh, swift water rescue course that we're going to send our two full-time staff again to be trained facilitators they'll bring that back to our community and provide our staff with the training to meet the swift water portion and then we'll be able to meet it all so right now where we are is we're we're beginning our, our ice water rescue training with our personnel yes we have limited equipment and that's what our budget is going to show our capital budget is going to show we're moving forward on so currently we do meet the bylaw we, we do do shore based rescue and, and you know do we do in water rescue uh, again as you see shore based rescue that entails a 75 foot throw rope and if we could walk a hundred meters into the lake and throw a 75 foot throw rope then that's you know that's an extra distance we can go but that's all we we can only walk in so what this is showing is where we're what we're looking for and, and coming up in our capital budget beginning 2020 we're, we're looking for ice water capital funding of twelve thousand one hundred dollars to get some more suits some ropes ppe and you've seen that inflatable rescue raft that was in the picture of equipment what we're looking at is buying the first one of those we'll station it out at station three and then two years down the road when 2022 we're going to buy a second craft which will station at station one so we'll have one at either end of the community that we can be deployed at any time and get that craft out to where we need uh, in the in the middle of 2021 we, we, we need a for, another forty two hundred dollars to buy more suits and, and PPE to ensure our people and, and the reason we're doing it over a three-year span if we ask for all the money at once all the suits would come due at once and we'd have to replace everything all at once so what we're trying to do is phase this in so as you can see in 2023 we're, we're coming up to $4,500 of annual replacement costs that we can continue to refurbish the the suits and equipment as needed and move down and every 10 years we would have to replace the uh, the uh, floating uh, ricks, uh, so we'd have to re replace those boats every 10 years. So with that in mind, every water rescue incident has a, is a unique situation, and we don't really know what they are until we get there. And the environmental hazards and water entry purpose of rescues are limited, right? So what we're basing our best knowledge and, and and all our our stats on is nfpa guidelines we've now got a training syllabus that we can provide to our people and we want to ensure that our waterways from border to border are covered and we can take care of those issues now you know anything our job would be to take care of everything above water and anything below water we have opp which have uh, you know services that can be summoned to come in and assist for any any issues that are below the water that's our presentation your worship thank you uh, chief and deputy chief any questions from council councillor Bondi thank you mr. mayor I want to, to thank the deputy chief and the chief for their time in making the presentation it's really good to, to touch base on issues like this right it's um, in the budget meeting that we had uh, McGregor about a month ago, I asked that question, you know, be because of the incident, because of the recent incident that happened at the harbor where two people lost their lives. Do I think we could have saved them? N no, but at the same time, I, it kind of opened my eyes. Anytime you see this little pink book, this little pink book has notes that I've made with outstanding issues. I'm getting a little long in the tooth, unfortunately, to be on council, so I have outstanding issues, and this is one. I remember, I remember having this discussion about, you know, the gap in service and going forward. And when that incident happened at the harbor, it kind of said, okay, let's look at this. What are we, what are we doing? And I do remember giving, uh, it was foggy because there's, there's only so much in that can, I can retain in here. There's a lot going on. So I do remember giving direction. I do know that in 2016, there was a competency test and, and there's been training, but there hasn't been requalifications. So now I'm hearing the reasons why. 
then I, I have my budget here and so what I would like to see is when the next budget items come when the next budget comes out I'd actually like to see your capital projects in here so that I have peace of mind I know that they're in here because and it does make sense what you were saying is hire uh, buy a couple buy a couple buy a couple year after year because that seems to be what we do with everything in fire uh, you know we buy we're constantly buying a few replacement helmets a few replacement pagers a few replacement you know so so I'd like to see that incorporated so that I have peace of mind um, currently right now I'd like to know you know how many station three firefighters are we going to train at this technician level because if if you know we're entitled to lives as well so you know deputy chief Malott may be gone away and you know and I know that there's only a couple suits out there right now so I want to make sure we always have that coverage because as a council person I'm only one of eight I understand that but as a council person I support this and I support giving money to this to make sure that this is important as, as for our residents I also think I don't I don't know how we do it I don't even know if it can be done but we could look at skill sets in the in the neighborhood neighborhood that have these skill sets I don't know I don't know if it's possible but um, so I just want to make sure I hit all my points so we set the policy we set the level of service this is something that I feel is important we live on Lake Erie we're attracting new development we're attracting tourists we're attracting people that may not be familiar with with our area so um, the cost per firefighter you know heaven forbid uh, you know I want to buy those suits and I want to buy all that equipment and then I want it to sit there and not ever get used but we, we don't know right we can't um, every body that goes into the to the lake you know on and I'm talking to shoreline will need to be rescued or brought back at some point they may not be alive but we need to get them you know I, I feel for our firefighters over the past incident that happened where you know there could be a mom or a dad that drives into the harbor and their children are in the back seat and then if we don't have the proper training they're sitting there looking at that car going down and the bubbles coming up I don't want that that's on me so I can now I can publicly say I support this and I support going forward I'm really happy with the plan you brought forward and it's really defendable and it makes sense so I'm glad that we got to touch base on this as a counselor it's hard to we had a, we had some budget meetings but we really didn't get to like add things in the budget so we, we really didn't as a council like we because administration did a really good job that's why we you know we had nothing to argue about nothing to lobby about they brought us a budget we're like this is great then I went home and I thought you know that's something that's something that I want to see in there so that I know it's in there so thank you thank you councillor uh, councillor Vandendor uh, through the chair the incident we're referring to wasn't that a suicide pardon me go ahead the incident where I mean somebody went into the water we keep calling it an incident wasn't it a suicide I'm just <clears throat> worried that we seem to be going off half cocked here I mean okay if there was a suicide, that's terrible it was a terrible thing that I don't think that means that we have to start committing our taxpayers to spending tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of dollars over 10 years we had one incident that required a boat one and we're surrounded by police departments and other government agencies that have boats. Amherstburg has a boat, Kingsville has a boat, LaSalle, Leamington, because they have big marinas. The MNR has a boat, CBSA has a boat, RCMP and CSIS have boats. We have boats coming out the wazoo. We don't, I don't think we need to go overboard uh, for some sort of aquatic disaster that I don't think is likely to happen. I think we're probably as well trained and equipped as we need to be. Thank you. Anybody else on council? <clears throat> I just want to ask uh, the chief one question. We we do have an aluminum boat, don't we, down at the harbor available to us? Do we have an aluminum boat or not? Through your at this point, no. None of our personnel are trained to be on a boat, so we can't really send people on a boat. What we do in event there's an, uh, uh, an incident in the and we got we got confirmation on the call that there's somebody. Uh, in the water, we have an we, we make an initial call to Kingsville, and their boat is en route at the same time we're en route to the call. So we're getting Kingsville there as fast as we possibly can. And at this point, uh, you know what we're doing is to enhance what what, our, what we have is we're going to be trained to the same level as Kingsville Fire, and what we may do is is offer our people to be able to go help Kingsville, and if they were short people, to go help them so that 
it keeps the cost down for everybody and we still maintain a level of service that every every municipality wants in the area so um, another question chief what was the response time when that car went into the harbor there from Kingsville well can you recall what the response time was there through your worship um, and, and there's there is guidelines out there that tell us how long we have to be in a rescue operation once the rest once an incident we respond to turns from rescue to to recovery we no longer have any jurisdiction that that's OPP so uh, in, in the event of a rescue depending on the, the, the temperature of the water you have anywhere from 60 minutes to 90 minutes to get there and get the people out that incident at the harbor that day we were able to get the individuals out of the water in less than the 90 minutes we were about uh, I think 80 82 or 83 minutes and we had them out of the water so thank you chief um, uh, councillor Bjarkman thank you to your worship uh, thank you for the presentation it was very good very in-depth I think one of the things we're not talking about or realizing this is training for our firefighters to protect themselves this is this is great training to send people out we're going to now offer a level of service but if I'm going to send a man out into a ditch that's overflowing that's moving at 20 miles an hour and he's never done this before back up a little bit we don't send our firefighters out to a fire in their cars to meet the truck because we don't want two firefighters getting to the fire by themselves and standing there thinking okay I can't go in yet because I gotta wait for the other two guys it's important that they arrive as a unit that they do their job that they they, they fight it together because they put themselves in harm's way so when you've got an issue like this the right people get called they go out to the situation they've got the training they've got the proper PPE and they can protect themselves while they're trying to save or recover or whatever it is so I think it's very important when we look at the costs associated with this there will be issues there might not be many but the time that they do go out and they are trained and they're protected properly based on what we spend money on and I see the the numbers here we're talking about uh, under 10 thousand dollars a year on average uh, I'm all in favor thank you thank you councillor Doug did you uh... your worship just going back to councillor Vanderdolen and a few comments um, we're not looking the recommendation wasn't to go to the water power craft it was to stay at the level two which is basically where we're at now so just so council is aware we're not looking at going to that third step but using uh, mutual aid thank you any other questions I can just say one thing unfortunately there was nothing we could have did at Colchester with that that event that happened out there it was just it was unfortunate and when you hit cold water like that it's it's very unfortunate huh four, four to five minutes you're gone yeah through your worship uh, just on a final thought is again we're trying to do a couple of things here and, and we're trying to be mindful of spending right which is what we're in, uh, you entrust us to do that's one and we're trying to be mindful of our employees because again we have part-time employees that you know part-time volunteer firefighters and to do this training it's enhanced training that's over and above what we require in regular training so you know we, we have to we got to be able to, to have that work-life balance and, and and ensure that the people that want to do this have the time to do it and and provide the energy for it so we're trying to be mindful of, of all those things and juggling all those balls and uh, and I think this is the right way to go and we thank council for your endorsement thank you very much gentlemen for the presentation is there any other questions can I have a motion to receive that report uh, councillor Bjorkman and councillor Bondi all in favor it's carried thank you gentlemen Point two. The following two notices of motion are for presentment only this evening with no discussion or consideration uh, pursuant to the procedural bylaw until the April 1st regular council meeting. 
Uh, the first notice of motion is from Councillor Guerin that the town sign bylaw 1350 be amended to require commercial property owners to remain to remove or conceal business branding from signs, windows, and doors within a reasonable period of time following the closure of a business. And the second notice of motion for consideration on April 1st is from Mayor Snively, that administration prepare a report outlining processes and steps in a detailed plan to move forward with rezoning Colchester Center from residential to commercial. Item 16 on the agenda, any reports and announcements from council members? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I just want to remind people that uh, the Essex Centre BIA is having their Excellence Awards um, banquet coming up. And until March 20th, which I think is two days away, I think that's on Wednesday, anybody can nominate a business. So if you go to the uh, Essex BIA's Facebook page or their, their uh, web page, uh, you can email in the, the business that you're in favor of. There's different categories there and why. Um, but it's a great uh, way to recognize uh, the businesses in our town. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Verbeek. Um, yes, I just have to steal this moment because Joanne Hayes, my mother, turns 81 today and she watches these meetings <laughs> and re-watches them. Happy birthday, my beautiful mother, Joanne. <laughs> uh, Deputy Mayor Malash. Nothing this evening, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a reminder to residents, January and February, March, you can get your dog tag for the regular price. It goes up April 1st, so if you haven't got your dog tag yet, head over to Town Hall and get it. <laughs> Councillor Van Endel. Uh, nothing this week, thanks. <clears throat> Councillor Bowman. Uh, since Councillor Guerin isn't here, I'd just like to um, thank the Essex 73s for a, a fantastic season. And uh, I think our mayor looked very nice in a, uh, a Lakeshore Canadian <laughs> sweater in the next few days. So anyway, congratulations to Lakeshore and uh, many thanks to our local 73s. Thank you. And I have to agree with you, Councillor. They were just a little, a little bit tougher than we were. And yes, I'll be probably wearing that jersey uh, Wednesday night. Uh, I forced uh, Aldo to wear ours, and I, I guess I'm going to have to bite the bullet and and wear the Canadian one. But they they very very good to uh, to the 73s. They had a good season, and and congratulations to the Canadians. They played good hockey. So. Item 17 bylaws bylaws for third and final reading 1795 to confirm the proceedings from the March 4th regular council meeting. I have a mover, uh, Deputy Mayor Malash and no. Councillor Bowman. Any questions? All in favor? It's carried. And for two readings this evening, 1798 to confirm the proceedings of this March 18th, 2019 regular council meeting. Mover, Councillor Verbeek and Councillor Bjorkman. All in favor? It's carried. Just look into adjourn. Yeah, and could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Deputy Mayor Malash and Councillor Bendel. All in favor? Thank you very much. Thanks, Council, and thanks the, for the input from administration. Thank you. And thanks for the people coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. <laughs>